you are about to experience Bubble and Squeak, the explicit podcast made for adults by someone who is often terribly childish. Hi, I'm Peter Santoscano, and this is Bubble and Squeak, a podcast with uncanny sounds, funny interludes, and stories most weird many true. Okay, here's season three, episode one. Our show today comes in three parts. Part one, a true story as if I told it at a stand-up comedy club. Part two, a true story about the Paul Taylor Dance Company and my wild past. Part three, a sound slice for my new study. Hey everyone, thanks so much for having me here. Um, my name is Peterson, and you may have noticed I've been hanging out, lurking in the back, and I thought, well, you know, I've been listening, I should at least contribute something. I, I just need to tell you, I'm not a stand-up comic. I actually don't even know if I'm funny, but, you know, from having been here for a few weeks, I realized that's not a requirement. I mean, in that you have really created this awesome, safe space where people can just tell their stories. So I thought I would. I've noticed that a lot of the comedy here has to do with relationships between men and women, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, and wives. And fortunately for me, I've got some material there because I have a absolutely beautiful wife. Well, actually, um, no longer with me. I mean, she didn't die. She just like wants nothing to do with me. But, you know, we spend time together. So I have some uh, stories. Uh, and you know, the thing that you need to know about me and my, well, now ex-wife is that before we married and while we were married, we were born again, evangelical conservative Christians who did not believe in or practice sex before marriage. So I was pretty naive. Uh, so I elder in our church gave me a book that he said this should help me. It was called The Act of Marriage. And it took me about 25 pages before I realized that the act of marriage is intercourse, copulation. It just wasn't very clear from the title. And in a way, that was like the whole book. I think its purpose was to inform without arousing. So it got kind of confusing. And I came to the book and I thought, I just don't know enough to even understand. Like, so for instance, at one point, the writers of the book went out of their way to say that the act of marriage is a holy act. It is sacred. The marriage bed is sacred. Therefore, the the marriage bed should never be defiled with improper acts. And I was like, yeah, I believe that. But like what? I mean, like what is an improper act because I, I didn't know and i was afraid like we might inadvertently slip into one but they just didn't say it because i guess they didn't want to give us any ideas or they just assumed that we knew what was right and wrong uh i was um perplexed by some diagrams that they had uh particularly of the of like genitalia of my soon to be partner i actually hadn't seen really any full frontal nudity. That, no, that's not true. I mean, I, I had, you know, like Playboy and stuff, but you have to remember this was the Bush era. Like people were really bushy down there. So like you really couldn't see, you know, the trees through the forest or whatever that analogy thing is. So I really didn't know what was under all of that. They had a diagram, but it was drawn with pen it looked a lot more like a map, you know, like one of those uh, topographical maps where they show you elevation. So that wasn't very useful. One thing, though, they said that uh, that the act of marriage is not just about procreation, which I thought, you know, was pretty racy for the time, but that it's about pleasure, too. It is the job of the partners to pleasure each other. And I was told that um, I could pleasure my partner because my partner had a special little button that I could press. And if I could find that button and 
play with it and tug on it and do different things to it, it would give my partner a lot of pleasure. They said, I would find this if I were imagining as I approached my partner that I was going up to a canoe. This button was the little man at the uh, front of the canoe or the bottom of the canoe, I guess, depending on how you approached the canoe. So I was like, great, I've got a job. <laughs> so the wedding night comes, we are like hyper and a little anxious. We weren't drunk because we didn't have any alcohol in our wedding. It was that kind of wedding and uh, anxious. And it didn't flow very smoothly because it was our first time. And there were lots of hairpins. Like she had lots of hairpins. In fact, there was a hairpin incident at one part of the act of marriage, but we, we, we got through it. Uh, and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't good. No, it was, it was, it was pretty bad, but I, I wasn't put off by this because I'm like, you know, this is our first time. I mean, both of us, we had never done this before. So, I mean, we completed the act, so that's something. And I figure it's just going to get better, right? It's natural. No, it never got better. In fact, it got worse. If that's possible, yeah, it got worse. And at the end of the day, I realized I, I just didn't like her. I mean, I liked her. I liked her a lot. I just wasn't physically attracted to her. Um, and it wasn't her fault. I mean, she was beautiful. I mean, men on the street looked at her all the time. I knew because I was looking at those men because turns out I'm a homosexual and, um, I really didn't want to rock the little man in her boat. I just wanted my own man in a boat. The other day, I attended a performance of the Paul Teller Dance Company, but during that time, I entered a time machine. I first saw the Paul Teller Dance Company in New York City in the late 80s. I had moved to New York to study theater, and I also was desperately trying not to be gay. But as a theater major, I was required to go to a certain number of performances every week. At a dance performance, I met a woman, Jennifer, who wrote for the New York Times. She did reviews. And we became dance buddies. We would go to the same performances of all of the major dance companies. Twyla Tharp, Martha Graham, Paul Taylor, Merce Cunningham, people... I had never heard of before and dances that they tapped so deep into this creative part of me. As I sat in the auditorium at Bucknell university today in central Pennsylvania, I was shocked at seeing Cloven kingdom, a piece that I had, seen on stage in the 80s, and how so many details were fresh. Like, I remember. I remember the costumes. I remember the movements. It took me back to that time when I was living in New York, desperately trying not to be gay, deep in conversion therapy, right in the middle of the HIV AIDS crisis. And it was in 1990 that I, I married a woman from my church and pursued this path of being a, a straight man for Jesus and for my wife and for the church and for America. And that ended disastrously. As I sat in the auditorium at Bucknell University today and central Pennsylvania, I totally slid back in time to those days when I was in my 20s, early 20s, and 
the world was before me, and I lived in this tight little box. And I wondered, what would have happened if I made a critical, dramatic decision at that time to not go down the conversion therapy path, to turn off of it, (laughs) and to try something different, just be myself in a world that clearly hated gays. There's no way I could ever know what my life would be like, or if I'd even be alive today. It was a, it was a dangerous time, and a lot of people my age who are gay never survived it. I am often asked, do you regret all those years of pursuing conversion therapy, 17 years to be precise. And I usually don't because I learned a lot of good things because of it, not from it, (laughs) but in spite of it. It definitely made me a more sensitive person to other people's sufferings. I definitely understand more about how power and privilege works and particularly male privilege. (laughs) I learned a lot about that straight masculine male privilege. But I don't often regret going through all that. I would not want to do it again. I would not want other people to do it. And if I were able to travel back in time, and I know what I know now, which of course nobody can do, I wish I had chose a different path. Just just to see what would be different and what was possible. Let me set the scene for you. After nearly two years living in South Africa, I'm back in the little town of Sunbury, Pennsylvania. In 2020, we sold our house, so now we rent an apartment in what was once a passenger railroad station. Rumor has it that on July 5th, 1883, it was the first passenger train station in the world to be lit with electricity. The tracks are long gone, But when I walk around the property, I see vestiges of train infrastructure. The train doesn't go past this building anymore, but other parts of town get lots of train traffic daily. In my study, I hear trains pass about a block away on 3rd Street. Bubble and Squeak is written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. I mostly make the show for me. Oh, and for my friends, George and Keel, who bought our house in Sunbury. The Bubble and Squeak theme song is Worthless by the Jelly Rocks from the album Bang and Whimper. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to music. To find more great music and new podcasts, visit rockhandyrecordings.com. Feel free to say hi to me on Twitter at... P two son, the letter P, the number two, S O N. Oh, and thanks for listening. 
For more shows like this one, visit rockcandyrecordings.com.